What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back to the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. I am joined once again by Rachel Hotmeyer. We finally, finally, finally have an answer. Aaron Rodgers is coming back to Green Bay. We have a plethora of things to discuss, Rachel Hotmeyer. But before we get there, most importantly, how the heck are you doing? I think I'm doing well. I think there's a lot of weight off of everybody's shoulders, whether as a fan covering the situation, you name it. Roger said he wouldn't drag this out. And thankfully, compared to last year, this is not dragged out at all. So I, I'm glad it's over for everybody's sake. We're going to get to Aaron Rodgers in just a second, but I tweeted this out as well. And I want your thoughts. The NFL is king. Like it is a random Tuesday in March. Mm-hmm. And Everything is happening. There is no reality TV show. There is no episode of Euphoria. There is no Batman movie. There is no NBA game, no Major League Baseball. There's no Major League Baseball game, period, uh, right now. But there's no anything that can almost compare you to a day like this in the NFL where Aaron Rodgers is staying and Bobby Wagner is cut and Russell Wilson is traded and Mike Williams is franchised and Harold Landry is signing to a long-term deal and just all of this. On a random Tuesday, free agency hasn't even started yet, and NFL is freaking king. Yeah, Real Housewives have nothing compared (laughs) to the power of one Aaron Rodgers tweet. If he can keep it under 140 characters, then so can all of you. Um, It it was really amazing. NFL Twitter is a wonderful place to be on days like this. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back to the time when we experienced news without all of this internet chaos. Uh, Today was, was really something. I think it's one of those days where you'll all remember how you saw it and how you reacted and felt for the rest of the day. It was one of those constant refreshers. It really was like, there was no dull moment. And every, like, even as you start saying like, all right, Rogers is coming back. Then it's like, all right, what does that mean? What type of contract four years, 50 million per year? Nope. Now he's disputing it. Like it is real time drama that you just can't get in almost anything else. It is crazy, crazy. And again, it's why NFL is King because all of it. I mean, I know like I'm sure NFL network and ESPN did like crazy ratings and obviously you were doing live stuff for NBC 26, which I'm sure did crazy ratings, but like, Man, oh man, it's just, it's absolutely beyond crazy what the NFL can do on just a random day in March, nonetheless. I don't know if you can hear, but my cat can't stop meowing because she hasn't had anyone to talk to about the Aaron Rodgers news all day because I just left the TV on for her so she'd be informed. And um, she just climbed into a box on top of my freezer. So I hope she finds people to talk about it with in there. I hope so too. That's amazing. I'm sure she has plenty of hot takes, probably better than anything you and I will discuss. Oh yeah. She, she has some thoughts on trading Jordan Love. <laughs> I guarantee she does. All right. Let's, let's discuss Aaron Rodgers though, because even within this one thing that happened on this day, there's so much to break down before we jump into the minutia of it. I just want to get your initial reaction. As you see Pat McAfee's tweet that comes out that he's returning to green Bay. What was your reaction? What were the, like sort of the first things going through your mind? I, I truly felt that there were a lot of factors, meaning this could go either way. Um, and, and it was a, I think I was still genuinely surprised to hear that he would be coming back. Um, yes, the cap is going up. Yes, the Packers have a war chest to dive into, so to speak. But I think I was just still surprised, given that people on both sides admitted that the Tom Clements move wasn't a sure thing to return Aaron Rodgers to Green Bay. So if that wasn't a sure thing to me, I was like, well, then what is? Right. Um, and if you're that uncertain, I could see him not playing at all anymore. Um, so I was just shocked. I stood up in my newsroom screaming, we have a deal. We have a deal here. Are the reports I'm dropping it in Slack. We go breaking in the studio with me and our morning anchor. Um, it, it was definitely a good day of newsroom chaos for sure. These are the days you live for in a newsroom, but I, I was still pretty surprised Um, at the numbers that were cited, even though Aaron says that no contracts have been signed yet and those numbers are inaccurate for now. um, I can only imagine the deal will still make him the highest paid player in league history for the time being. But I think overall, I was still slightly surprised that he returned. Yeah. I think the only thing that surprised me was just like, I, I sort of knew that it could come out of nowhere at any given moment but just the still the suddenness of it still sort of took me by surprise, like especially on a Pat McAfee Tuesday um, where I just assumed that if he was going to make that announcement, he would go on the show and actually right. make it. So Pat tweeted it earlier, um, especially with no follow up for him to be on the show. Like I could, you know, th- there's just so many different ways I would have expected that to go. That wasn't one of them. 
I, I was on the record as saying, I thought if it was that he was looking for a trade that that would have released earlier before he went on McAfee, that Schefter or Rappaport or someone, because I just don't think he could have gone on McAfee and been like, well, I want to tell you, Pat, I'm demanding a trade. Like it just, I don't think the optics would have been great. So if it was leaked, I was expecting that. If he came back, I was expecting him to do it on McAfee as like this good news sort of thing. So um, I was just surprised at the suddenness of it and the fact that it was leaked ahead of time by McAfee and the fact that he was returning. But overall, um, as of as of late, this is still what I was expecting. Again, nothing would have surprised me, but I, I just I still felt it, it never passed the sniff test to me of all the positive things he was saying, how he like the people matter, Bakhtiari's here, Adams was going to be here, like all these different things. And then to be like, and, and how the team and the players have had his back through all of the stuff that he's gone through with the offseason, whatever. And like all of a sudden just be like, nope, demanding a trade. It just never totally passed the sniff test for me, but Either way, he's back. Huge news for Green Bay. It is a franchise-altering moment. No matter what happened, whether it was retire, trade, come back, it it, it totally alters everything. I want to go back to what you mentioned, though, from the contract terms, because we hear from McAfee, and then Rappaport immediately tweets out, you know, it's four, you know, four more years with two hundred million more in in money and guaranteed, like one hundred about sixty three guaranteed, fifty three guaranteed. And then all of a sudden, Pat McAfee says, no, that's not true. And then Rogers later in the day tweets, no, that's not true. There's no contract. Where do you come out on trying to read between the lines of what you think may be going on with that contract? Yeah, it's super interesting um, because we all know Aaron likes to control a narrative. um, And so do the Packers at that point, ultimately. So whether this was a deal that Packers are putting on the table, whether this has been verbally agreed to and nothing's been signed yet. Um, I do find it very interesting that he's willing to commit to returning, but nothing has been signed yet on the dotted line. Um, But ultimately these aren't random numbers. That's for sure. And I think the deal could still ultimately end up being that if not extremely close, maybe Rogers decides to change some details just because he wants to own the news moment. But ultimately I see that being a pretty realistic, mutually agreeable point. Yeah, I think so too. And I believe the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? I think, Rogers, like you said, those numbers weren't pulled out of thin air and Rappaport is continuing to report on those numbers. Usually those are leaked by an agent, especially when the numbers are that good, um, wants to make that the, the, the agent and the player look good and in, in how much money they got. I do believe it's going to make him the highest paid player, highest paid quarterback, et cetera. However, I believe the first part of that from McAfee is true as well, that this will be a team friendly deal for the first probably one to two years of this contract. And I think that's what Aaron is probably going to want to figure out. And I'm sure that's what he wants some of the messaging to be as well, that, Hey, this is going to be a team friendly deal as much as possible for these next couple seasons. So that green Bay can retain as many of these players as possible and can go all in and can make a run to a championship. I guarantee you, Aaron has no interest in having the salary cap hit anywhere close to $50 million in these next couple seasons, making it so that the Packers can't make a run, you know, truly at a championship. So to me, the truth is somewhere in the middle. He's going to get paid, 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 paid. Meanwhile, it's going to look a lot better for these next couple of seasons. And I'm sure Rogers and, um, and his agent and everyone, even Green Bay, is probably going to want to spin. I don't even know that it's spin, but tell the story as, um, hey, we're making it so that you can compete for the next couple of years as well. So that's, that's kind of where I come out on it. Yeah. And, and I have a couple of points about that, you know, with that four years, 200 million number that's being thrown out there um, just to give you all some food for thought. Someone in my newsroom did the math today and that would equate to 125 or $150,000 a day. Just, just normal calendar day. Then if you really want to have some fun, take that down to average playing time minutes or even game weekends. Game. Just, just that is a, that books brings truck to shame. Like that there's no way to really uh, quality quantify that type of money. Um, So it's just astounding. I was talking to Kevin Harlan earlier today and he kind of compared this obviously not financially the same, but think about the moment in the nineties when the Packers really made a splash by signing Reggie white to that huge deal. Um, And the kind of comparable moment there is here in the Packers being the smallest North American sports market and consistently proving that they're willing to put their money toward the players that are driving this franchise toward the Super Bowl. I thought that was a really interesting moment for someone so close to the franchise to to kind of see the story in similar ways here that ultimately, you know, again, obviously that was like what a 
couple teen millions um, for like a three year deal. But it, it is interesting to see that at different times when the pressure cooker is on, the Packers have been willing to go into, like I said, that sort of war chest in order to make things happen. That's why you build up um, things like this. And think about everything that's happened to Lambo and Titletown since then, you know, and, and building the franchise today that makes it a little more than just Green Bay um, and really does start to draw people in other than just playing for Aaron Rodgers. So um, I thought that was a really interesting moment to kind of compare the seismic impact of this deal. And you bring up, and I guess he brings up an amazing point there as well. And I think some of the things that we lose sight on. So there, every once in a while, there's an exception to the rule. And really the two big exceptions to the rule, in my opinion, are Reggie White and Charles Woodson, where you go out and you actually gain a otherworldly player who's a free agent and they actually come to Green Bay. And as we know, Reggie White was, um, you know, he he came to Green Bay, but there was a lot of suitors. And that was really the exception to the rule. Charles Woodson, there weren't suitors. There was really nobody that was offering what Green Bay was offering. And they had to go above and beyond just even to get him to listen to an offer for coming to Green Bay. And it is very difficult if all, th- like if all things were created equal and Aaron Rodgers was a free agent and had never played for Green Bay before, the odds that he's going to just sign with the Green Bay Packers as an unrestricted free agent are next to nothing. And you can make the same argument for Devontae Adams and so many of these other players, Brett Favre, et cetera, where if they were actually on the market and had never played in the market previously, your odds of bringing them to Green Bay are insanely slim. Mm-hmm. So when you get a Devontae Adams, a David Bakhtiari, a Kenny Clark, a Jair Alexander, an Aaron Rodgers, et cetera, you hold on to them like grim death because as the Milwaukee Bucks and the Milwaukee Brewers and the Green Bay Packers can all attest to, trying to find those free agents that want big market deals and are looking for the best option and want to play in a big market, they're not coming to Green Bay more often than not. So there's always an exception. Reggie White, probably the biggest one in Green Bay history. But if you have those opportunities to keep those players, it's good business if you're the Green Bay Packers to make those decisions more often than not, which leads me to my next question. And I know I kind of just maybe answered this in some capacity, but do you feel with the, it, let's just hypothetically say that this is a four year, $200 million deal. Is this a good thing for Green Bay to pay a player that much money at this age? And ultimately, do you think that Green Bay made the right decision by bringing him back at that price point? I don't hate paying Aaron Rodgers through age 42 that much money. I think I, as someone who's worked in professional sports salary caps before, am extremely keen on the way they're doing it. I mean, Gudikins has not shied away from the fact that they're doing this a very saints like very credit card. This is just a bubble waiting to burst. Yes, the cap is going up. Yes, they've got 25 million this year. That's almost enough for what Devontae Adams wanted overall. Um, you know, but I think ultimately it, it is scary that the team just kind of keeps pushing this cap off and just keeps running that bill. And the only way to determine if that's really worth it is if they come home with another trophy. And if they don't, a lot of people are going to be SOL. Um, I don't like swearing on here. Um, I I just think this is a a really fascinating way to play with the big bucks. Um, I don't think it's bad that they paid Rogers. And I think for both the franchise legacy and Aaron Rodgers legacy. I think this deal was essential. It's also a deal that I do think involves some kind of good faith money that keeps Rodgers around the franchise longer after his playing days. If he plays through age 42, I don't know that I see him playing longer than that at all. If he gets to 42, this is assuming he plays all four of those years. Uh, I think this is some good faith money to kind of keep those exclusive rights, if you will, in their market and encourage him to come on as a sort of consultant. I don't see him coaching or going over film, but a sort of consultant, regular face around the league, a more active veteran presence um, around the locker room around 1265 that would keep him an active participant in the team, if you will. Sorry, the cat toy is going crazy. Catnip these days. Um, But ultimately, I think that's kind of just what shows where they're willing to put the money and what that really means. I I just have a feeling with this deal that this is kind of a little extra to be like, yeah, we really love you. Obviously we've gone through this for 17 years. Here's a little extra, even if it hurts, because hopefully this is the last we're paying you on the field and let this be a good segue to keep you around in sort of the same vein that Rogers previously mentioned, he kind of had to bring Favre back into the fold when the hall of fame stuff came around. So this kind of skips that awkward bridge. 
Yeah. And again, another really great point on your end. And I think sometimes we forget that these decisions are not made in a vacuum. And yeah. what I mean by that, and I, I went on the record, I created the video right here on pack a day that said it's time to trade Aaron Rodgers. And ultimately I stand by that. I think that may have been the best ultimate decision if green Bay wanted to go in that direction more on that in just a second, but I've also said, give me an A or give me an F. If Green Bay wanted to go in this direction and go all in with Aaron Rodgers again, totally understand it. Because I think you can make a strong argument whether you go all in or whether you go, you know, like sell off and try to rebuild your best opportunity to win a Super Bowl in the next decade is probably this season with Aaron Rodgers. So if that's the direction they want to go, especially in the state of the NFC, more on that in just a moment as well, I can totally, totally understand it. But going back to my point of this not being in a vacuum, this is a business and these are people with jobs and these are real life human beings. And there is a legacy with Aaron Rodgers at stake here as well. And what he means to the city and this franchise overall, the first part of that being that Brian Gutekinds, Russ Ball, Matt LaFleur, those guys probably like their jobs and they probably want to keep their jobs and keeping Aaron Rodgers for the next three to four years, probably not only, has them keep their jobs throughout, but they're probably getting an extension well past that, which by the way, is very advantageous for those gentlemen um, and deservedly so for what they've done over the last handful of seasons and beyond. So that matters because it's easy for me to say, Hey, they should go and rebuild, like go out and let's see what happens. And you know what? I think they can get enough draft picks and things like that from a franchise standpoint and from a front office standpoint and a coaching standpoint, there is a crap ton of risk that's involved in that because yeah, it might be like, okay, we're going to rebuild for a handful of seasons and then we're going to be ready to go in 2027 and have one of the best rosters. If you rebuild for five seasons and you have five bad seasons, Brian Gutekunst, Russ Ball, Matt LaFleur, et cetera, may not be there in 2027 when things start looking up again. And that's not an easy decision to make either. Also, by the way, Asked Ted Thompson, even though he made the right decision, not an easy decision to make an outcast of the number one player in franchise history. And Brett Favre, same thing with Aaron Rodgers. Those, those are not easy decisions to make either. So while I could have made and have made a strong argument that I, I could have seen Green Bay going in the opposite direction, and maybe, maybe it would have been advantageous to do so, totally don't discredit this decision at all and totally respect the decision that they wanted to go in. And this very well may still end up being the right thing. So I I have no qualms with the direction that they wanted to go with at all, even though I've sided on the other side a couple different times. But as you mentioned, let's, let's talk about that. I think as the Rogers news broke today, that sent, you know, earthquake tremors through the quarterback market. And what we saw the Seahawks get for Russell Wilson is kind of a glimpse at what Rodgers would have been worth on the open market. Obviously Rodgers would have garnered more, but the fact that Seattle is hauling in picks, you need a dump truck for that itself. Then you get Font and Locke and Shelby Harris. Like, what are we doing? And maybe are the Packers looking at this value being like, should, should we have considered? Should we have taken calls? It's interesting because I, I agree with a couple of things. I, I disagree actually in a couple of things though. So first of all, I would argue Russell Wilson is actually more valuable than Aaron Rodgers at this point, simply due to age, uh, lower contract, not a threat to retire after one season. I think, I think Denver gets a much more sure thing with multiple years of Russell Wilson in in a deal than probably what could have been maybe one, maybe two years with Aaron Rodgers, or at least having the flight risk that they could send three first round picks or whatever, or this huge package for Aaron Rodgers, he could get hurt and then retire after the season. Like there's a lot of risk involved in that. So I, I believe that, you know, if, if, if I were Denver and I had the choice and in this package is what the, the Packers could have got as well. If I had the choice between Rodgers and Wilson, I probably take Wilson in that scenario um, just based on a a couple of those different things. So I I don't think Denver's probably too upset about that, but from a green Bay standpoint, it's interesting. I I actually think, I actually think Denver won the trade with Seattle. I think, you know, a couple of first round picks, a couple of seconds. I know they gave up a lot, but finding a quarterback, especially one that could play five, six, seven more years in Russell Wilson, I think that's a lot harder um, than, and a lot more valuable than you know the picks that that Seattle got back in return. Now, what I agree with you with is it is an interesting look at it from Green Bay standpoint because even if this trade was maybe like 
whatever, whether, whether they could have got this trade or not. It's already been reported that Washington was offering three first round picks for Russell. Like some team was going to give this level of compensation for Aaron Rodgers, right? Yep. Maybe it wasn't this exact deal, but some team would have paid out the nose for that type of uh, play for Aaron Rodgers, even if it was only for a season or two, like Washington, um, whether it was, would have been Denver, the Pittsburgh, et cetera, somebody would have done that. So I still think it's a worthwhile conversation to have. And like, and like you said, yeah, it, it's tempting if you can have those picks and uh, you know, where again, you may get one to two years of Aaron Rodgers. There's a, there's, there's a, a risk there either way, right there. It just, it's, it's such a difficult conversation to have because there's so many hypotheticals and yeah, you, you like, there's an opportunity cost either way. Like you just don't, and you, there's no calculus to say this one's going to be better than the other. You would just have to trust your front office to make the right decision one way or the other, whichever direction they went in. Absolutely. It's just a, a fascinating, like, what if it, I would love to know what was truly on the table. I mean, right. Well, Washington was putting up, apparently Washington asked Seattle if they wanted more players and that conversation just wasn't engaged because Russell Wilson had the power in this situation because of his no trade clause. So yep. it's really fascinating to see what Hackett would have tried to get Denver to put out there if Rogers could have come. And, and by the way, I think it's also worth noting here, right? Like a couple of things, a, Rodgers may have put a kibosh on any trade not to Denver. He might have said, you know, Green Bay could have had five first round picks. Well, that's not realistic because you can't do that. But uh, three first round picks and a bunch of players from, you know, Washington or whatever. And Rodgers, he's going to have said, no, if, if I'm if you're trading me anywhere, I'm going to Denver. And Denver, as we just discussed, may have said, well, actually, we've got a deal for Russell Wilson. And we're going to pause on that right now unless something falls through. Um, and maybe the things weren't related at all, which is probably, which is where I probably stand on the topic, but there's, there's nothing to say that there was this perfect offer that Rogers even would have considered going to another plate. Like all of those things we're just not privy to. And it's just, you know, we're, we're trying to put the pieces together as best as we can. Um, but I, I think we can't make the immediate jump to conclusion that Green Bay, there's a chance that Green Bay didn't even have this option, right? It could have been Rogers said, I want to go to Denver or not. And Denver's like, we got Russell and that's the end of it. So it's either group back to Green Bay or retire. Either way, he decided to come back to Green Bay. Last question on Rodgers and then we'll move on. Do you, I'll get to my thought on it in a second, but do you think they can compete with Rodgers and Adams more in a moment, paying them exorbitant amount of money? They've already paid Kenny. They've already paid Jones. They've already played, paid Bakhtiari. Like you do run out of money at some point. Can they put enough of a competitive team together to ultimately win the Super Bowl and, and get that Lombardi back to Green Bay. There's a lot of slices in the pie to be made here. Um, competitive, yeah. To the Super Bowl again, or at all. Um, that's a tough one. That's a tough one, you know, because there's some pretty, I mean, when you're looking at priority next signings, I think with the cap going up in this situation handled and allegedly Rogers cap hit going down, you have to think Zadarius Smith is next up. You know, even though we all assume that'd be a cap casualty, you have to assume you're getting that sort of pass rushing back. Um, Do you, you know, Zedarius is back. I think it'd be shocking at this point with this development, if the, if, Rodgers was taking a lower salary cap hit for this year and next year, and you don't immediately go and bring Zadarius Smith back. I and think that's questionable. I think that has to be number one. And then Devondre Campbell is next. I think, Dev I think, I think Z's gone no matter what I think. And right. then I think Preston and Devondre become the, and, and like probably an extension for Amos. I think those become the priorities. I could be wrong. I certainly have been before and I certainly will be again. And I was of the mindset that, that Z was gone, but I think, I think if you're given this capability and you're totally fine running up, you know, daddy Lombardi's credit card, then um, I, I would think that the Packers would at least try to bring Z back on a deal. Now, who knows what types of calls Zedarius is getting, you know, rebounding from the injury. If people think he looks good, I'm sure he could get more money elsewhere. And I do think the Packers would try to lowball him in order to type uh, kind of secure that. So does Zedarius want to be back? Is this his chance to, you know, get a ring? So interesting debate there. Um, there oh God, should we? Okay. We should. All right, yeah. We got a shot on it. Okay, great. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, it is just super interesting. I mean, this, this didn't just send earthquakes, you know, on the quarterback market, this completely shaped the NFL. And I'm hearing more and more that both teams and agents on all sides of everything were really pretty paused around the league until the Rogers domino was to fall. Yeah. And I think that makes sense, right? Like whenever free agency starts, whether it's NBA, major league baseball, NFL, it's always those first two biggest dominoes that need to fall first. And then everything sort of falls after that. And because Rogers, like you said, it's a, it's a shift through the league as a whole. It's not just like what teams are, you know, are, are like acquiring a quarterback or whatever. It's what teams are feeling like they could potentially go all in and what other teams need to do to win their division or when like, it just changes everything. So yeah, I think the Rogers thing falls and then the Russell Wilson thing falls, and then we're going to get a bunch of stuff after that. So I agree with you. And it's, it's just going back to a second. I, I think Green Bay, you, we talked about Russell Wilson. We know Tom Brady retired. I look at this NFC. I know the Rams are a good football team. Uh, they're a really good football team, but I look at the NFC. You got the Rams, you got the Packers, you could probably the 49ers with a first year quarterback. And I mean, first time starter in Trey Lance, you've got the Cardinals, which still, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not intimidated by the Cardinals. you got the Cowboys, maybe no Amari Cooper. And then it's a bunch of question marks. Like yeah. there's no Drew Brees anymore. There's no Tom Brady. There's no Russell Wilson. Like a lot of your best quarterbacks and best teams are not what they were right now. This very much seems like Rams Packers. I know they got to play better. Listen, they got beat by Jimmy Garoppolo and the 49ers at home in green Bay. Like yeah. it, it, it's more than just having the better quarterback. Um, and the quarterback needs to play better in those games as well. No question Not about hurt it. Hurt your toe in quarantine. That too. Uh, but I don't know. I look at the NFC and say it's a very winnable conference. And if you're doing this again, you know, you, you obviously have those aspirations and now it's up to the players on the field to go get it done. I think they have more than enough talent to go at least get to a Super Bowl and then just see what the heck happens from there. Yeah, the NFC is a ghost town right now. It is the wild, wild west. Anybody could walk in with their pistons and spurs and shoot the whole place up. Honestly, this this landscape really changed in the last 12 hours. Very much so. So the the aftermath of Aaron Rodgers and this decision is Jordan Love. Like yep. now, and again, one of the things I feel like we don't know is just what this means long-term for Rodgers. We could end up looking at this deal for year 200 million and then look at it on paper and be like, oh, this is, we're going to go through this all again next year and not know if he's actually coming back. Like this could be a one year in and out sort of thing. We just don't know at this point, but again, assuming that it is, you know, two or three years and Rogers has the opportunity to retire in green Bay. What does this mean for Jordan love? And would you consider trading him? I think what's important to remember in discussions like this is that you can only look at the decision to draft Jordan Love in the way they did in the lens of that moment. I don't think they really foresaw this moment happening when they took that opportunity, because if the two re realities were the same, it wouldn't have happened or someone would have been fired by now. Um, so you have to remember, you know, the decision to draft was made with the information and the working relationships at that time. All of that information has obviously changed on both ends. So I do wonder what the trade value is out there for Jordan Love, but I think the biggest calling card is going to be if the Broncos come calling for him, because if Nathaniel Hackett doesn't see the potential in him and come calling for at least with Russell Wilson, backup, a backup to develop under, like if he doesn't think that like, oh, it's fine, let me take Love, develop him behind Russ, maybe get him in a little more active situation, take that fifth year option. To me, if Hackett isn't eager to do that, then I think there's some question marks there for sure. Now, I also think it could be really good for Love to have the time to develop under Tom Clements. That's the benefit of keeping him here. And maybe this deal gives him just enough time to raise his ceiling and be ready for when Rodgers is finally ready to step away from the field. But um, I, I don't really know who's interested in him at his current playing level. And I think that's a really tough position to yeah. put him in and to honestly to evaluate him at. Yeah, there were there were a couple of reports. I, I forget, and I, I apologize to whoever did the report that they did. Uh, they interviewed some scouts around the league, and they thought that Green Bay could get a second round pick um, for Jordan Love. And and to me, if you're Green Bay, I think you have to sort of jump at something like that. I don't know. I 
it's a difficult conversation because Jordan Love is still still represents a lottery ticket to some extent and could end up being uh, really good. But obviously, Green Bay hasn't had that same level of, of faith in him that they had in Aaron Rodgers when he was ready to when they were ready to make that move from Favre to Rodgers. And I don't know, it, you like these are unprecedented times, like right the, in the last 30 I years. I thought we were done with that phrase. Unprecedented times. Yeah. What? I <laughs> Put that to pandemic, not football. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. There. Yes. Agreed on that. But from, from a purely Packers standpoint, right. They never used void years. Like they would never yeah. have entertained giving Rogers this much control or this much money this yeah. late in his career. Like someone got their first credit card and is going to the mall. Exactly. Right. Like these are, and obviously the pandemic affected the salary cap, like everything. And I think, and I, I love Andrew Brandt to death. I think he does a tremendous job. And he, I, I thought he did a great job of saying like, yep, I took the L today. I got, I got a couple of these things wrong. I'll gladly own it. That's just the type of person that he is. But I think the reason that he got those things wrong is he's, he based a lot of his stuff based on what Green Bay's done for three decades, which in every other season, he would have been a hundred percent right. But again, we're operating in a, a time that uh, in a way that Green Bay has literally never operated in their history before. In the last 29 years, if you said, would Green Bay ever entertain trading a, a guy that they spent a first and a fourth round pick on for a late second round pick just two years later who could develop into a good quarterback, I'd say there is no chance in heck they consider doing that. Right now, where they need for, you know depth on their team and cheap players, and they could potentially trade love for a guy that could help them, I don't know. Like if you could get a second round pick, I think Green Bay has to entertain that. So no, I still expect him to be on the team, but I, I only feel like 50% confident on that. Yeah. It, it's a curious situation because does one year on working with Clements, you know, really improve him. Maybe. Um, also like, what are, what are you accurately looking at with that second round pick that they genuinely think would be depth enough to actually fortify this sort of winner go home situation. Um, the, this whole, you know, Super Bowl mindset, it, it really has me thinking, okay, if in two, three years, Roger steps away and they didn't come out of this with the Super Bowl, that's how many years in a row that you were supposed to be on the biggest stage and you got in your own way. Um, I, I don't know how, you know, history is going to look back on this. And the other thing too is, Yes. As we sit here right now today, Aaron Rodgers potential four-year deal. It seems like, all right, there's no use for Jordan Love, whatever. Pat McAfee said that Rodgers was very much considering retirement. There's a real opportunity he could play this year and be like, all right, I'm, I'm done after this year. I'm going to retire. Like no matter what that contract says, he could leave after this season and you still want something there to be like, okay, this could develop into something. So at the, at the moment it might in, you know, the immediate reaction might be like, all right, see you later, Jordan Love. I don't know that that much has potentially changed from a risk standpoint that Rogers still might move on and you still might need a quarterback next season, 2023, meaning yeah. next season. So, yeah, I agree. And I still think Love is farther along in terms of scheme and implementation than Bankert is. Oh, very much so. I'm a no. million times over. Yeah. So, oh, by the way, uh, Devontae Adams signed a franchise tag as well, which normally would dominate a singular podcast episode in and of itself for a good 20 minutes, but is on firmly on like the second or third page of today's news, but it's still very important. Nonetheless, Devante is, you know, has a franchise tag. Green Bay gives it to him. Um, he's right now bound to Green Bay. Can't have unrestricted free agency. This is still going to end up in my opinion, resulting in a long-term deal. It could get ugly before it gets nice, but um, your thoughts on Green Bay tagging Devante Adams. Yeah, the non-exclusive aspect of it makes it very unique. And that means eight days from today. So about a week from when people are listening to this on March 16th, when free agency does open, he is able to talk to other teams, but the Packers have that first right of refusal. So they have the right to match that. And if they don't, then they would get two picks in this year's two, not first round, but two picks. And, um, this year's upcoming draft. So like some immediate capital back, you know, if they were to lose him, it's interesting because that is technically like the cheaper option of this franchise tag, but they do have to act pretty quickly. I know Devonte technically still has until July 15th to actually negotiate and work on a long-term extension for this. But if the Packers want to keep negotiating with him past March 16th on this type of deal, 
um, they are on the hook for that 20.5 million this year. Yep. So it, it is just an interesting blend of situations. Obviously, this is way off from the money Devonte wanted as of now. Um, his camp seems to be looking closer to 27 or 28 million. The Packers would love to get that down to 23 or 24. So obviously, it's a couple million dollars that most of us would never see in our lives. But it's it's you know the money deserved for the number one wide receiver in the league. So it, it's a very interesting discussion to have. But I think for now, this is the only way to kind of keep that, um, you know, retainer in place for now, because if you just let them loose, I don't know if Devonte is even considering sticking around, even though now, you know, you have the quarterback back, you could keep this tandem in place, but it, does Devonte really want to do that? Or is it time for him to chase the bag? And I think there's so many things that make this such a unique franchise tag. I think, first of all, obviously that DeAndre Hopkins contract really sort of messed up the entire wide receiver market and made this way more complicated than what it probably should have been. That's number one. Number two, in most cases, the, the, the team that puts the player on the franchise tag, they would prefer that the player just signed the one year franchise tag. And then you wait until next year to either put another tag on them or sign a long-term deal. That is usually to the benefit of the franchise, right? Not this year for green Bay, because they can't take a 20 million 20. cap hit for yeah. this entire season. If they want to build out their roster, they need to sign a long-term extension. So that first year is as cheap as possible and you're pushing money into future years. So Devante has that as leverage in this situation as well. Again, along with the DeAndre Hopkins contract, with the fact that also Devante is about to be 30 years old. So this is his real opportunity to get a payday. And also knowing that the Packers window is literally right now for the next, you know, one to two years. So that, you know, if he sits out or whatever, like Green Bay loses a ton uh, on that. So Whereas again, normally Green Bay, I think has a lot more leverage in this situation. I think Adams and his agent actually have a ridiculous amount of leverage. And then, oh, by the way, Mike Williams signs for three years, 60 million on the same day that Devonte yeah. gets the tag. And you could have made the argument before of like, you know, you know, 25, 26 million per year for Devonte Adams sounds about right. If Mike Williams is going for 20 mil per year. Yeah. yeah now I'm thinking that 28, 29, 30 mil for Devonte doesn't sound so far off. So exactly. the whole thing is going to be super, super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The, the real ripple effect of this is, and honestly, depending on how fast things were working behind the scenes, you almost hope that by Rogers, if those numbers were true, were playing into a team friendly deal. Maybe they had the opportunity before the deadline today to get something done with Adams, but it really seems like Packers camp wasn't engaging at all with Adams and his agent until the Aaron deal was signed for better or for worse. All right. So we kind of discussed this a little bit earlier we know now that Green Bay has a lot of work to do over the next week to get under the salary cap. I would expect a Jair Alexander extension at some point to help with that. Rogers contract will somewhat help with that. I still think Zedaria Smith is the lowest hanging fruit to get under that. I think Preston Smith signs an extension to get under that. But either way, there are going to be some moves. I know you mentioned potentially Zedaria's coming back. What do you see as the next sort of I don't know, moves that Green Bay makes to try to get under or under the next week so that they can kind of still keep everything moving and also try to have some free agent money to bring back a Devondre Campbell and maybe a couple of these guys that they actually want to bring back. Yeah, I, I like an Amos and a Preston extension slash restructure that would, again, keep be pretty backloaded to this extent. God, this just gives me anxiety. Just like thinking about how much money is out there and, and yep. nobody else is going to be here. It's going to be a desert wasteland and there's just going to be cha-ching, cha -ching Um, Yeah, I mean, that that logically makes sense to me. They're, they're pretty high up next in line on the list. I just think with what the Packers are looking to continue, if they believe it's Darius Smith's you know, back recovery. I just, I, I don't even know that I would bring him back, but I just really have a feeling that that's what the Packers are thinking of doing with this money next. And again, a team friendly deal. Um, but, but I really think where's a Darius Smith's worth that really depends on if he genuinely wants to be back here and running that back. Yeah. Injury. If he wants to be back, yeah. what type of deal he's looking for, all of those things are going to play a major role in that. So either way, like this is, as we've talked about all of like, this is the first domino. Now green Bay has a lot of work over the next right. week. These moves are going to come fast and furious because they have to green Bay has to get under the cap by next week. And they have a lot of work to do in order to get there. 
Let's move on to another topic that, again, we touched on a little bit already, but also would have been a full podcast worth of talking about in most situations. But Russell Wilson traded from the Seahawks, obviously, to the Denver Broncos. And we talked about the hypothetical of Green Bay could have got that deal. Nathaniel Hackett, Russell Wilson now teaming together in Denver. Denver looks like it has a crazy team. I think the AFC West might have better quarterbacks than the NFC, which is crazy. Like they're just that freaking talented. It's going to be a really fun division to watch, but I, I more want to talk about the state of the NFC. And I know we touched base on this a little bit already, but as we mentioned, Tom Brady is retired. Russell Wilson is now traded away. Like the quarterbacks in the NFC aren't quite what they once were Stafford. You've got Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, Aaron Rodgers. I don't know. Is Kirk cousins, the fifth best quarterback in the NFC now, like, it's kind of crazy. So it seems like things would set up pretty well with Aaron Rodgers coming back to Green Bay, Russell Wilson and Tom Brady now gone. Yeah, they definitely don't have any gunslingers to be worried about over here. That's for sure. There are certainly plenty of other threats in the league. And, you know, a lot of teams have compensated their lack of talent under center for the other side of the ball. But ultimately, yeah, the NFC is in a very interesting place. Maybe we should do an NFC state of the union, state of the conference. That would be fun. Um, and, and honestly, I think people kind of need it, kind of need it, a, a kind of wake up call to really see where we're at. Russell Wilson getting traded out was huge. Um, and allegedly that's where Russell wanted to be was in Denver. And that was kind of beneficial to the Seahawks to kind of trade him out and not have to worry about that. So it, it's a very interesting, like win-win situation for both of them, but really does leave the NFC kind of wide open. Yeah, it really does. I I'm really, and of course, some team's going to step up, right? Some team will be better. Um, not that I want to touch this conversation with a thousand foot pole, but we still don't know what's going to happen with Deshaun Watson. If he potentially gets traded, he could go to the NFC who knows. Right. So there's, there's a lot of things still on the table. I know I agree that we're not touching it, but, um, yeah, this, there's going to be some team that probably ends up a lot better post free agency trades draft, et cetera, than what it looks like on paper right now but who that is and how that comes to fruition remains to be seen. But as we sit here today, to me, the NFC looks totally up for grabs and certainly winnable for green Bay. All right. Recap of the day. Rogers is back. Russell Wilson's in Denver. Mike Williams signs a three-year $60 million deal with the chargers. Chris Godwin, Mike Gesicki, Dalton Schultz, Cam Robinson, Devonte Adams, all get the franchise tag. Yeah, that Landry, Godwin tag. I know that's crazy. Harold Landry signs a massive deal with the Titans Bobby Wagner and AJ Klein released. Uh, that's it. Uh, that's it. Any, any other, that Bob, on honestly, the Bobby Wagner release kind of sent me a little bit. That was, that was a, a little bit of a spiral after the day. The, the hamster wheel up here has been back on its hinges, but that was a crazy one. Yeah. I mean, this is like, this is the baseball way of doing things, right? If you're not going to be, if you're not going to give me an A, give me an F. If you're once you trade Russell Wilson away and have drew lock as your quarterback, mm-hmm. like, at that point there, you know, Bobby Wagner's your, your 30 year old players, keeping them on the roster is only giving you a worse draft pick, not helping you win a window now. And it makes more sense to move on, save the salary cap money for future years when you're ready to compete and be as bad as possible. So you can get as many great draft picks until you're ready to compete again. So I get it, but it's still just jarring to see the Seahawks team that was really good for a, you know, it opened up a pretty long window for a good period of time, just completely gutted at this point. And I saw my favorite tweet of the day, I think was poor Noah Fant, who goes from Drew Locke at quarterback in Denver to uh, Drew Locke at quarterback in Seattle. So poor Noah Fant. Poor I'm Noah curious, Fant. Um, speaking of tweets, did you see the Seahawks tweet from Castaways? Yes, I did. An interesting, an interesting choice. I will say this. It is the NFL or it is the teams and GMs and everyone's responsibility to be good and talented and figure this out from here. It is the social media's team to gather engagement. And while I think it was a very interesting choice and probably wouldn't have advised it as a social media specialist or whatever, um, if your goal is to get engagement, you certainly won the day with that. So a choice to say, to say the least. Yeah, it, it was a choice. And I'll admit, I didn't. I didn't know the movie. I'm not a movie person. I I obviously could tell who the actor was and I could like infer the joke, but I was just like, huh, this is a very like interesting moment to go with public humor on. It was. And I guess I wouldn't have advised it, but sort of get it. If that's what you're trying to, if you're just trying to get engagement, then tip of the cap, you did that. There's one other uh, free agent news and note from the day. 
Rachel <laughs> Hotmeyer is officially a free agent. She is no longer at NBC 26. I will let you take it from here because I don't want to, you know, spoil anything or say anything else. So uh, c- first of all, congratulations on a ridiculous run at NBC 26 and for being so incredibly talented and, and having an awesome run uh, in Green Bay at that station. So congratulations to you. Whatever comes next, I know you will absolutely crush and kill. Uh, you will be more than missed in Green Bay. And uh, yeah, I hate you for leaving. <laughs> Thank you um, so much. Yes. Uh Thanks to 12 for making my last day so much fun. Um, Although I did think it would be funny if we both announced we were leaving on the same day, but alas, uh, I gave the Packers an ultimatum. It's Aaron or me. And they chose Aaron rightfully. So I would have liked 200 million though, just in case Um, I'm not going that far. I will still be covering the league in sports and other aspects. So you guys will definitely hear about things when they're official, but the past few years have been nothing short of fun and amazing memorable times of growth and incredible stories. I could not be more thankful for this chapter of my life, getting to cover the Packers, getting to know so many Packers fans who are inimitable people in themselves. Um, getting to be on this podcast is the highlight of my week every week, even if I make Andy wait five, 10 more minutes. Um, I'm just so thankful for everything I've been able to do, learn, see, and accomplish here all for Packers fans. Well, you didn't bring a Super Bowl to Green Bay during your time in Green Bay. So Sadly. ultimately your reign will be considered a failure, unfortunately. Right, so, right. It was not worth the money. Yeah, no, it was it was definitely <laughs> a failure. But uh, I appreciate it nonetheless. You did sort of help bring a, a championship to the Milwaukee Bucks, I guess. This so is true. This I is will, true. And a Ryder Cup victory. So yeah, so okay. You've got a couple feathers in your cap, but <laughs> the, the main one that you were here for, you still came up short on. So just remember that. You will always be a failure in Greece. Always a failure. My resume sucks. You've been amazing. I appreciate you so much. I wish you the best of luck. I can't wait to hear uh, what your next move is. So definitely make sure to keep us posted. Any final thoughts before we get out of here? Uh, just not to worry, day. Packers fans. This this will not be my last appearance on here. That is for sure. But I, I hope everybody's happy. I, I hope people are happy that Rodgers is coming back because there was just so much vitriol and discussion over this. Um, I'm curious if people genuinely think that's overpriced for him, those numbers out there. Um, but you know what? I think this is a great day for Green Bay. And I, it's also for people to remember that, you know, Rodgers and, and this historic helm for a quarterback, you know, it's not just about the team and the win record. This impacts the economy. This impacts so much in the greater Green Bay area. So I know a lot of people that are very happy that today happened the way it did. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's always tough to see a player like that in a different color jersey, right? I think we all remember, I mean, there's so many, right? Whether it's Peyton Manning, Joe Montana, Brett Favre, <laughs> Tom Brady, Tom Brady, etc. It just is, uh, it's weird to see it's off putting at times. And for now, at least Aaron Rodgers remains in green and gold. Tough to be too upset with that, uh, with that sort of uh, decision. I have to think like after this deal, after the last two off seasons, back to back, I don't think he plays in another Jersey. I don't, I think it's green. I want to see the contract first and then I'll, then I'll weigh in on that. <laughs> Rachel, amazing, amazing, amazing stuff as always. Nobody I would have rather broke this down with on a crazy day than you. Appreciate you so much. We will keep everyone posted with your next move from here. That does it for us today. Thank you so much for joining us. We have so much more to discuss. We'll be back at it all week here on the podcast. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure to follow Rachel on Twitter at Rachel Hotmeyer. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.